Right? Does it say that it's on yours, chapter three? Yes. It, I mean, it is chapter six, but it says three. I'm an idiot. Change it to chapter six if you would, or just make a note of it. Uh, that is bad. Look at that, all of them. <laughs> okay, if I do something stupid in the future, let me know right away. I know you're, you guys are very polite, but um, yeah, sorry about that. Okay. All my silliness aside here. Okay, so I think we stopped on um, um, uh, materiality. And <clears throat> materiality, it actually comes in two different um, two different properties, basically. There's a quantitative and a qualitative. The quantitative is the one that we normally think of. This is the uh, dollar amounts. So you say, okay, $600,000 is material. So that if there's an error of 600,000 or more, it's material. If it's less than 600,000, if it's 300,000, it's not material. So uh, quantitative is a quantity. Yeah, how, much, how many dollars does it take to be material? Qualitative, and 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 we'll, we'll, the next page has some um, some we're, we're going to do that on the next page. Figure this stuff out. How, how you know how do you come up with the six hundred thousand? So qualitative, qualitative is that it matters what the uh, mis, material misstatement is, you know, or what the misstatement is to see if it's material. So this is a materiality that does does not have to do with dollars. Not typing very well today. Um, we look at what the characteristics are of it. For example, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of things that we that, that um, of things that may, you may be a qualitative material, maybe. Uh, material because of their qualitative aspects. Uh, management fraud. We have to rely on management to some extent. So management fraud, we look at a little bit more closely than say fraud from somebody else. You know, if, if there's somebody, a supervisor on the loading dock puts in a fictitious employee, takes that paycheck for that fictitious employee and puts it in their own bank account, okay, uh, it might not be material. You know, maybe if we have 600,000, they're embezzling, what, you know, 60,000 a year or something, that may not be material. And you may not do anything with it if it's just the, uh, someone working on the uh, a supervisor on, say, the loading dock. 
if that same thing is done by somebody like the controller or the treasurer, well, now you got a problem because you're supposed to rely on being able to rely, rely on those people, the controller, the treasurer. And if they're being dishonest, you know, that is a problem. So one of the things is management fraud is one of those things that is a qualitative uh, consideration or characteristic that might make something that is otherwise not material become material. So even though the fraud is only for 60,000, who's doing it makes a difference. Um, <clears throat> we talk about this too, a violation of contract. And if there's something that's immaterial, but it violates a contract, that is also a qualitative consideration in that, look, normally, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter, but this is in violation of the contract. For instance, if, a, if they're supposed to get the, all their loans through the same bank and they get a loan from somebody else, it's immaterial. Well, if they have a contract with the bank that says all, you know, all lending has to be done through this bank, then it's a problem because it's a violation of a contract. Uh, reverses a trend. So if you had a company that's been profitable for the last 50 years and this year they're not profitable, but they cook the books a little bit just to make it profitable. Well, there's been a company that's profitable, one that's not profitable in the, you know, in the eye of investors is huge. So if it reverses a trend, that is another thing that is qualitative. In other words, the dollar amounts may not be material. They might be clearly immaterial, but these are things that you have to look into that, you know, depending on what they are, looking at the characteristics of the misstatements, that even if they're not material, you know, the dollar amounts aren't significant, then you, but you, they, they might still be material just because of other factors, you know, management fraud, violation of a contract, reverse the trend, those are the, probably the biggest ones that you'll run into. Any question on that? So materiality is not just a dollar amount, okay? It's, it's not just a dollar amount. It, it's a dollar amount for most things, but uh, when it comes to certain conditions, management fraud, violating a contract, reversing a trend, those things are all things that make it, um, that, that the dollar amounts are not as important as the characteristic of it, what, what, what the actual substance of it uh, is, is more important. I'll tell you a funny one about the, you know, being able to trust management. I had a friend did an audit and a lot of times in big companies, you, you won't work with the actual controller who's the head of the accounting department. So controllers are the head of the accounting department, but a lot of big companies, those people are pretty busy. So they have assistant controllers and they, those are the people that handle the audits. And so they were dealing with this assistant controller who was like a, a pathological liar. The guy would just talk about this crazy stuff all the time. Talk about how he was the, you know, USA junior chess champion when he was 14 and he pitched in the, you know, he won the little league world series when he was 12 and, you know, just crazy stuff. You know, he worked on programming for the CIA when he was 17, but he can't talk about that because it will get people killed. It, it just endless stuff. And when they would go in and talk to him about questionnaires, like, you know, seeing about the controls that the company would have, they'd read off his list and he would say yes to some and no to some. They say, well, wait a minute. It, you said yes to this, but no to this. And he said, well, I, was, I was testing you on that. And you know, they'd ask, okay, well, so who signs off on this? And, you know, I can't tell you that. Well, why can't you? Well, because I'm doing an investigation of my own and my investigation would be uh, you know, jeopardized if I were to tell you, know, just nutty stuff. And so they went and talked to the controller and the controller just kind of laughed. He said, yeah, he, he doesn't he embellish his stuff, you know, yeah, just you know, come to me. And so they ended up just going to the controller on it. And they asked him, you know, well, what might you keep him? He said, well, he, he does everything right. You know, he does, he, he's, he works like a dog, you know, he, work, he gets everything done. And he said, when he starts talking like that, you just, if you just tell him to knock it off, he will. <laughs> they, they spent like three days, you know, before they found out that they really couldn't trust this guy at all. Okay, so here is materiality, the dollar amounts. And this is kind of what intuitively you kind of think about, you know, if, if these special circumstances aren't present, 
you know, this is usually what you think about when you think about um, materiality. And these are kind of what they call rules of thumb. Different audit firms will have different rules of thumb. These are, you can tell just by looking at them that these are gonna be judgment. You know, the percentages are five to 10%. Well, you know, 10% is twice as much as five, right? So, you mean, you know, these are rules of thumb. These are things that, that some companies use. Um, and, and most CPA firms kind of use their own. They, they kind of figure out their own materiality amounts. All right. So some of the things they look at is say income before taxes. They'll say, like, arrange percentages, five to 10% of the income before taxes. Total assets, you know, again, this is a half a percent, so 0 0.05 to 1%. Total revenues, same total equity. I'm not sure they came up with this, but uh, anyway. Um, these are out of the book, but but the, uh, the the idea is though that it's re it's relative to the size of the company. Okay, now the percentages allowed are inverse to the client size. So for instance, we're gonna do this first one here. This is the, we're gonna use this one as the example. A larger company will use a smaller percentage. A smaller company will use a larger percentage. And I'll kind of show you why as we go on here, but small companies use the larger percentage and you get big companies, they'll use the smaller percentage. So it's inverse. So whenever you get ranges like this, uh, think about it being kind of inverse. And, and you know, there's, and there's companies that are in the middle. Okay, so company A, income before taxes is 150,000. Okay, is that a big company or a smaller company? Small. Yeah, it's smaller. So we're probably gonna use the higher, you know, 10%. So we would calculate the materiality for this company as say being, oops, not that, 1,000 times, say, So we say that this company would have an overall materiality would be 15,000. So as we go through the audit, we're looking for things that are $15,000 or more. Things that are less than 15,000, we're probably not gonna make that big a deal out of it in total anyways. And using that same thing, we have a company that is has income before income taxes of 50 million. Now, 50 million is a pretty good sized company. It's not the biggest company, but it's it's getting there. It's you know it's a good middle sized company. So we would probably pick something between five and ten percent. So, what number do you think? Something between five and ten, say. Seven and a half. Sure. So we would take uh, 50,000, no, 50 million, I'm sorry. And again, this is, you know, these are all judgment calls. So 7.075. Uh, Oh, I know why this is like the calculator is not coming in because it's a solar power. Kind of light. Okay, so uh, what is it? 50 million? So 3,750,000. Mm -hmm. 
So that would be the materiality for company B. So looking for things that are uh, 3 million, 750,000 uh, or, or more, you know, those seem to be. And down here, this is one of the bigger companies you're gonna find. So we would probably use the 5%. $1.5 billion times 0.05 equals the number. $75 million. Yeah, right. 15, yeah, that's right. Oops, I need, I need more zeros here. Okay. So you can kind of see though that the smaller, you know, the smaller the company, the larger we allow them to get out of line, shall we say. And there's a good reason for that. Yeah. <clears throat> Quite honestly, you're probably not going to get sued for $15,000. The lawsuit would cost more than $15,000. So with smaller companies, because the numbers are so much smaller, a lot of times you give them more leeway because your actual risk is actually very small. Um, so you know, $15,000 is a... You know, is a fairly, even though it's a larger percentage, it's still a fairly small number. Your risk of being sued for that is not very much. Now, coming down here though, people will sue you for 75 million. <laughs> uh, you know, so, um, it looks wrong. Okay, um, you know, it, it, as you get, you get, you start getting into the tens of millions of dollars, it really becomes, you know, you don't want to go into court and say that you missed a seventy-five million dollar error, you know. So, you know, especially you start getting into these hundreds of millions of dollars and all that kind of stuff, the numbers just become so big just because the companies are so big, you know, uh, they're they're. You know, other financial statements, their profits and their numbers and all that are so big that, you know, you, you really have to watch it because again, these are, you know, 75, 75 million is a really large amount. Um, and so that's why they kind of go in, in their inverse. Small companies get bigger percentages. As they get it go up and up, we get hold them to a, a tighter um, percentage because the numbers are just so big. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, there is an overall materiality that you know you come up with some way. This is just a made up number. But you might be wondering, well, how do you get, you know, is that when you look at these numbers, is it? Is it 3750000 per account or in total or what? And it's generally in total that you're looking at these if they're misstated in total by this amount. Well, that runs into a little bit of a problem because when you're doing the individual accounts, you know, you have to know how much you're looking for. Okay, so if the overall material is 200000 but that's for the entire audit. So how much... You know, of this, are we going to give to cash? How much for accounts receivable? How much for inventory? So, you know, as you as you go through here, you know, this is a, again a judgment thing. You would probably, you know, assign some of it to cash. These are the only accounts you're using. Um, you know, say maybe I don't know, fifty thousand to accounts receivable. 
And the inventory, uh, let's throw in the rest of it. What is it, 140,000? And they call this performance materiality. This is, I, I think the term comes from this is when you're performing the audit. So if you got the cash account, if you're doing the audit and you get the cash account, you're gonna be looking for errors of $10,000. If you're doing the accounts receivable, you're looking for errors of 50,000. And if you're doing the inventory account, you're looking for errors of say 140,000. So the overall maturity gets split up. Now I only split up between three, three accounts here, but it gets split up among the other accounts because you have to know what you're looking for. And quite honestly too, some accounts are uh, more exact than others. For instance, cash. Cash is one of those accounts that a lot of times you can audit to 100%. because You can get bank statements on it. Whereas inventory, especially if it's a large company, it's a little bit more tricky to get that to 100%. So you might give a little more leeway down here, you know, and tighten it up on some you know, other accounts. So anyway, this is performance materiality. And this is a fairly new term, but it is basically when you split up the materiality for each individual account. So overall, we're looking for 200,000, but for each individual account, we'll have a performance materiality. Questions on that? No. Okay. All right. Um, types of evidence. These are just this is this kind of a list of types of evidence that we're going to. What's we got left here? I think we're almost done with this. Uh, this should take too long. Okay, um, and this is kind of just a list of evidence. It's, a lot of time, you know, evidence is is basically what you're going to use to make your opinion on, and you have to get enough of it. <clears throat> uh, you know, the rules are. Actually, change that appropriate. So that you must obtain sufficient appropriate evidence, and this is get enough evidence so that you can su to support an opinion. Uh, sufficient is a dollar amount. Appropriate is a quality amount. So enough good evidence to support an opinion. And this is how you do it. The one that's kind of obvious, inspection of records and documents, you'll go through their sales, uh, you know, sales orders and all this kind of stuff, looking through their documents. Inspection of tangible assets. you'll actually go and look at the tangible assets that they have. You know, you go out on the shop floor or whatever and say, okay, you guys have 14 trucks. Let's see the truck, you know, okay, here's nine of them. Where are the other six? Oh yeah, they're all making deliveries. Okay, well, we'll count those when they come in. You know, so you would actually look at the tangible assets going around and seeing the tangible assets and tangible assets, um, example. if this was a tangible asset, it would have a tag on it and those tags should be able to be traced back to the accounting record. So if this was you know, a tag, I'm making this up, uh, 12897, I should be able to find 12897 in the accounting records that would reference this. Yeah, for your evidence. 
Uh, observation. I think I talked about this. Did we talk about these? I can't remember. Watching people. Watching how they do something. Inquiry. Asking employees. By the way, which one is better evidence? The observation or the inquiry? Observation. Yep. Yeah, because this is your own knowledge. This would be the more what they call persuasive. Uh, confirmations. Confirmations, there's different confirmations. There's bank confirmations. There's accounts receivable confirmations. There's accounts payable confirmations. And what confirmations are is you are confirming amounts with third parties. So you get a bank confirmation. Okay, they say that they have, you know, whatever. $68,000 in their checking account. Do they have $68,000 in their checking account? Account receivable confirmation, the same thing. Do you owe them you know, $13,000? So uh, confirmations are your, your count, you're confirming with outside sources. It's actually a little bit better evidence than, it's not a little bit better, it's, it's much better evidence than getting it from the uh, client because it's, Theoretically, ways it's a objective third party that's going to be saying, "Yeah, this is how much they have in their bank account." The bank, you know, the bank has no knowledge of what they're putting on their books, but they'll say, "Okay, you know, they have sixty-eight thousand in their checking account at that year end." So this is actually very good evidence uh, confirmation because it's um, outside uh, something other than the client. Uh, recalculation, you'll do recalculations for, um, for instance, depreciation. Uh, uncollectible accounts. Might do a bank reconciliation. Compare it to theirs. Reperformance is when you actually get in there and do it. Um, And I'll tell you one about <laughs> kind of funny one about that. I I worked for uh, Navistar, and we have a warehouse up in we have a warehouse up in uh, Canada that uh, had a problem with their inventory, and they had a weird problem with the inventory. The problem with the inventory was they go out and take a physical audit, you know, a physical uh, inventory. They go out and count up all the stuff, and they have way more stuff than they should. So, you know, the, the accounting records show that they had, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but let's just say 21 million in inventory. They go and count it up and they have 27 million. So they have like 6 million more of inventory, than, you know, it, which it, when you audit inventory, it usually doesn't happen that way. <clears throat> you know, inventory disappears because, you know, 
sometimes through theft, oftentimes stuff gets broken, gets thrown out. Um, you know, things happen, you know, it gets, it gets damaged for some reason. Um, so usually what you're dealing with in inventory is there's inventory missing or damaged inventory that you can't use, you know, that, that sort of thing. So having additional inventory is way strange because that's what they did. They, they, you know, they, they had way more inventory. And what was happening was in, in doing with, with auto parts and truck parts, there's, all, there's always a lot of returns and stuff. The returns were coming in and while they were crediting their accounts, they weren't actually putting the inventory back on the books. The inventory that was gonna be resold was, was never put back on the books. So they were reshelving all this inventory and never getting put on the books. And, and it was a complete mess. You know, it, it was a new inventory system. New accounting systems are always risky. If you ever do an audit when they have a new accounting system, you know, as much as they do testing and all that kind of stuff, um, a lot of times, you know, the procedures don't get followed or whatever happens. Uh, it, it's a very risky thing. It, it can be risky anyways. So, um, you know, it was, it was kind of a mess. And, and we, we talked to different people and you get all these different stories about how to do it. So me being the new guy, uh, my supervisor says, okay, Mark, uh, you know, you're gonna go get the returns and go through the procedures of everything, putting them away, how they record them, you know, on the computer and all this kind of stuff, you're going to do all of it. And so that's what I did. I, I tell you, it took like an afternoon. And, uh, it was one of those things that raise up and down, you know, the um, lift things. Terrifying. <laughs> if you ever, if you ever, if you ever get a chance not to ride in one, take it. But there, um, but you know, I, but I went through and I got, you know, the procedure, you could just see, just so that we knew how it was actually being done. And then we can start working on how do you fix it, you know? So, so reperformance is one of those things, you know, and again, it's reperformance is better evidence. Again, we were talking to all these different people inquiry and they said, no, 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 it doesn't look like, yeah, it does. Oh, no, 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 it doesn't. Cause you know, you know, you get all these just weird stuff. So sometimes you go, okay, wait a minute, we'll just do it ourselves and see what's going on. Okay. Uh, analytical procedures. Do I have one of those here? I don't. I should. Um, did we talk? I think we talked about these. Maybe we did. Nice just between data, usually ratios. And do we talk? I thought we talked about these. Maybe it is. Maybe it's in something else. But they, um, they basically point you in the right direction. For instance, if well, let's say you know the economy is doing bad and that sales in this industry are down by six percent, but you go into this audit and you find out that your client has a sales increase of say seven percent. Well, that's really strange. You know, it's really strange that the the industry itself, you know, has this drop in sales, whereas your client has an increase. Now the analytical procedures in and of themselves are not evidence of fraud. It might just be the client's doing well, you know, for whatever reason, they're doing better than the, their competitors. But it does highlight and say, okay, wait, we got to look at this because this, you know, if, if everyone else is down 6%, a plausible relation would be, okay, they're going to be down by 6%. When that's not there, then you go, okay, well, wait, we got to look into this. So, 
And again, it might just be they're doing better. So chemical procedures in themselves are not usually evidence of fraud. However, they kind of point you in the right direction. So you, hey, look at the sales because this isn't, you know, this is a little bit unusual. So you're, you're looking for, um, I should probably say plausible. Uh, scanning data. This is one of those ones that kind of seems, it doesn't seem like it's a very, you know, concrete step, but it actually is. When you scan the data, you're going to look for a few things. Um, <clears throat> one thing you look for is, um, It's very unusual to have transactions that are in nice round numbers. You know, most of them, you know, they're you know, $6,217 and 18 cents. You know, that's a normal looking transaction. For whatever reason, a lot of times fraud occurs in nice even numbers. That's one of those almost humorous things that when people steal money, they do it in nice round numbers a lot of times, or when they're cooking the books, they do it in nice round numbers. Uh, you're looking for things that are, And just transactions that, that bypass the subledgers. You know, there's a sales subledger usually. So a sales subledger, you know, whenever you make a sale, because the sale is all done the same, right? You know, you look at Walmart, they have all the cash registers. Every one of those sales is exactly the same. The general entry for those would be exactly the same. So they have these subledgers, and the subledger will feed into the general ledger. If there is a transaction that doesn't go through those subledgers, that could be a problem. That could be somebody cooking the books because companies are set up so that you know these typical transactions all go through the same system, the same subledger. That's why they that's why they set them up that way. Um, so if there's something that doesn't go you know, through that system, you know, then there might be a problem. <clears throat> Some letters isn't a word. Oh, okay. Um, and kind of going along with that, if you have a single uh, there's a manual. Manual journal entries are always a little bit suspect. Not that they don't happen, they do, but uh, usually manual journal entries are are a little bit odd, especially in the larger companies. So even if they don't have a, a, a subledger, any manual journal entries will oftentimes be something you want to look into. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I think we do, I think we talk about tested controls and uh, I almost quit the Zoom meeting. Uh, <laughs> you guys have been happy, uh, but uh, I think we I think we uh, talked about these before. Maybe not. Test two. Oh, I guess we don't need one there. Something wrong here. Okay. So we'll test controls. Whatever their controls are, we'll test them. So if we wanted to see, okay, every purchase order has to be signed by a manager. Okay. Well, we can test that go get the purchase orders and check to see if they're signed by the manager. That's a control. If there are purchase orders that are not signed by managers, that's a problem. So we can test the controls. We can say, okay, are these working or not? Now, these are not dollar amounts. These are looking at the controls themselves. You cannot tell if something is misstated because the control isn't working. So test the controls, or, or can we rely on the controls? And if we can rely on them, that means we can reduce over other testing. If we say, you know, gee, these controls are really good. Okay, we'll, you know, test less stuff now. It, 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 we have a more efficient audit because we test these controls. If we can't rely on them, then we have to do more testing somewhere else. So if we go, oh, these controls are not, like, like the inventory thing I just told you about, you know, the, the controls were, you know, obviously not working. So you can't rely on those. You have to just go out and you know do a physical audit and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, yeah, so the controls are working and these are these are yes no tests. Not dollar amounts. So not dollar amounts, these cannot be used to determine uh, material mistakes. So test of controls cannot be used to determine material misstatements. They are only there to see if you can rely on the controls or not. So if the controls for purchase orders are good, we might back off on some of our other testing saying, look, we can rely on these, they're really good controls. We looked at all these purchase orders. Every one of them has a signature on it of a manager. You know, it seems like they got their ducks in a row. We're, we're you know, we're confident in these controls uh, that they're working. On the other hand, if you can't, if you cannot um, rely on them, then you go, okay, well, forget about the controls. We, we're gonna have to do something else because we can't rely on these controls. And that leads us to substantive procedures. And this we've already done. This is uh, like classical sampling. Uh, this is like uh, monetary unit sampling. So 
that, that, that we're still working on. And these are used for, these are, So some of the procedures, and again, these are ones that we, we finished or are going to finish soon. You know, classical sampling, monetary unit sampling. Those are for dollar amounts. And, and, and you recall on those, we have the estimate, you know, the projected uh, misstatement. You know, projected value, projected misstatement, like those are dollar amounts, right? We can say, okay, you know, these are off by ninety thousand or whatever it was. I can't remember, but you know that you can actually use those to make an estimate of what these, what the uh, misstatement is, and and then determine whether they, you know, it's, whether it's material or not. How? Well, based on those rules of thumb that we did earlier, you know, based on these. When we do this, our sampling for um, our substantive procedures, classical sampling, monetary unit sampling, when we do these, we can then make an estimate of what the, the books are off by and if that is material or not based on these. Well, some sort of procedures are the ones used for dollars. So test the controls are just to see if the, the controls are working. Some sort of procedures are actually to find dollar amounts, but, but they're only to find dollar amounts. They are not to see if the controls are working. And the reason I say that is, is, you know, suppose you have purchase orders that aren't signed by managers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those purchase orders might be completely legitimate. You know, it's just they weren't signed by the manager. So when you do the testing, the substantive testing, you're only going to look at the dollar amounts. Whether it was approved correctly or not approved correctly, it doesn't make any difference. You're only looking at the dollar amounts. And that's the thing about controls. It's possible to have really bad controls, like materially bad controls, and have financial statements that are not materially misstated. So bad controls do not always equal um, this thing, let me write that down. Let me, no, I'll, I'll put it into words so I can probably do it better. Um, Okay, material control weaknesses do not always lead to material misstatements. Now, we might not be able to rely on the controls, but that does not mean that the financial statements are misstated. So material control weaknesses do not always lead to material misstatements. They can, obviously, but it's not... Um, it's not always the case. Question on that? No. All right. Uh, these are the assertions that we, uh, 
when you do an audit plan, you always audit to the assertions. And I think we talked about these, at least some of them. And let's come down here. This I think is a little bit more. Uh, a little bit easier to kind of see. Um, so substantive audit plan for a, uh, asset accounts. So the first one is the existence of the assets. So you go find the assets. A set of the company has rights to the assets, okay? Are the assets leased? So you go find the asset. Okay, you know, here's the asset. Okay, there's a calculator. Okay, here's a calculator. Just because you found that physically there is the calculator, it doesn't necessarily mean that they own it. Maybe they're renting it. I mean, calculator's kind of a ridiculous thing, but you know, if this was like a big piece of equipment, it's not that uncommon to have it being leased. And especially you get something like an airline. It's amazing how many airlines don't have any airplanes, you know, um, because they're leasing them. So they've kind of tightened those up now. It, now it's not like it used to be. Uh, most, air, most, most airlines will have airplanes now. But um, anyway, the, um, uh, that even though you can physically go see it, does not necessarily mean that they own it. So that's what I have to do work to see if the company has the rights to those assets. Um, and one of the ways you one of the ways you see that sometimes is you know either that it's leased there'll be you know lease agreements payments to lease com lease companies you look for who the if there are payments to lease companies. Also, sometimes banks will have for loans and things like that they'll have collateral pledged. And in that case, that it might be that the bank actually has the title that they're holding until the loan is paid off. So there are you know, a couple of different situations that you might run into for that one. Uh, there's the completeness of the records. Trace assets to the books. So, you know, part of it, you go you, you, in the books, they'll say there's this uh, asset, this equipment, whatever, and you go find the equipment, okay? You make sure that it exists. But there's also another problem that could happen. There could be something on the floor that is not on the books. When we talk, when we talk about this, a lot of times auditors will talk book to floor, floor to book. Book to floor is, does it exist? Floor to book means you go find something on the floor and say, okay, I found this, you know, I found the, I found the scissors. So now I'm going to go find the scissors, make sure that the scissors are on the books. Yeah, so you're gonna see if the books are complete. Yeah, so this one's sometimes called um, And, and they, they say floor, but it, it, it's kind of a general term. Anytime you trace something back to the books. And this is floor to book. So you find the asset on the floor and you trace it back to the books. And if it's not on the books, it might not be in the books for a good reason. Maybe it's, they don't own it, maybe they're leasing it. So it isn't this necessarily that you, you find something that's not on the books and you say, woohoo, they're criminals. Um, a lot of times you say, okay, well, are you leasing it? Well, yeah, there's a lease, we don't own that. You know? So 
you know, you might, when I was doing auditing, I, they had these huge conveyor belts at one of the, uh, this is when I worked at US Steel, these huge conveyor belts that, for iron ore. I, I mean, like giant, like, like, like 15 foot tall rolls of this stuff. And I saw a number of these and I'm like, well, we're, you know, I'm looking, where are these on the books? And they said, well, we don't own those. That the supplier comes in and puts them there. And then the supplier comes back. And if they've taken a roll out, the supplier charges them. So they, the, the supplier is just leaving them on our, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like a, con, a consignment thing. They were just leaving them on our property because we had tons of property and they didn't want to you know, have it hanging around their place. So they would just come in and, you know, uh, charge us for whatever and, and there's controls over that that we went through but you know all these big roles they they were they were on the books for a good reason we didn't own them okay i determined to do appropriate valuation you're going to look through invoices and that sort of thing Any determine the uh, financial uh, statement presentation and disclosure. And the disclosure they're used is usually talking about footnotes. So, you know, if they have assets, the depreciation method and all that kind of thing, this is taking a lot longer than I thought. Sorry about that, guys. Um, that uh, if, if, if they have a, a certain de depreciation method and uh, all that, well, whatever, those will show be disclosed in the footnotes. Okay. Um, well, the next page is this. Where is there? Okay, this isn't too bad. All right. Um, transaction cycle for classes. This is new, fairly new. I'm not 100% sure why they came up with these, to be honest with you, but it doesn't really matter because in my opinion, it doesn't matter. It's what the ISCJ says so when you're taking the CPA exam. So we we always look at the accounts, usually going through the accounts, you know, how much is in the cash, how much is the accounts receivable, how much is in the inventory, blah, blah, blah. Well, they said that you should also look at the entire cycle. So the entire cycle of, uh, say, sales, you know, you have sales. You have cash collection, uh, you know, recording the sales, all that kind of stuff, accounts receivable. So you have these different cycles that they break up for, um, you know, to, to audit the cycle itself. Now, quite honestly, the actual tests are exactly the same. It's just a kind of a different way of thinking of, about it, but it, it really is the same thing. If you look at the tests for accounts receivable. It doesn't matter whether you're testing the account itself or through the revenue cycle, uh, the tests are, are the same. So now having said that, you know, the, the uh, AICPA, they do have this, that, that there are accounting cycles that you should at least be aware of the accounting cycles and the, the auditing of the accounting cycles. The only reason why I say it's kind of, it, 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 um, it's a little, a little odd is that usually you do things, for instance, oh, let me give you an example, cash. If you're doing cash, so you got the bank statements, you got the bank reconciliation, you got, um, there's a number of different things, bank confirmation, there's a uh, cutoff statement. You usually do that all at once. You know, when you go through the cycles, it'll say, okay, here's cash sales. And so you'll go through you know, the cash sales and those cash sales be separate from say expenses and it's separate from accounts receivable collections and some from accounts payable payments and uh, you know 
usually you just do the cash all at once. I mean, you get all the stuff right there. You just do it, you know. So um, I, the reason I say it's a little bit strange is that, you know, you generally don't have four different auditors doing different cycles coming in and looking at the cash. But, you know, usually they do it all, the, all at once. But regardless, uh, these are the cycles for the uh, AICPA. You know, and it, it, it's, there's nothing in the testing that's any different. It's just a different kind of a, like a different way of thinking of it or, or um, going through the cycles to see how they all interconnect. Okay. Uh, audit documentation. Who owns the audit documentation? The auditors. And the planning performances, the audit is also evidence of these. So the working papers will be as show evidence of planning, the performance actually doing the audit. And supervision. There will be supervisors will sign off on the different work papers. It's not uncommon to see four or five people have their signatures on a work paper either electronically or physically. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that the associate auditor does the work. The senior definitely looks over it, will sign off on it. If there's any questions, they'll write it down, tell the, uh, you know, the associate to look into this, clear it, what they call you know, clearing the notes come back with it cleared and then, and then they'll sign off on it. And then it goes up to the manager. The manager may have notes that they have to clear uh, the partner, you know, certainly. And you may have other people from the outside looking at that also that may have things that they need to clear um, before they sign off on it. So it's not unusual that, and the documentation is that look, you know, these are people that looked at it, this, those will be included with the work papers. So it shows evidence of that supervision. So it'll show evidence of planning, of uh, performance and of supervision of it. Um, support the, uh, for the audit report or for the opinion of the audit report. Okay, so this is, um, we already talked about this. Yeah, sufficient appropriate evidence to form an opinion. Uh, working paper review, this is done by outsiders. Um, it could be done by the AICPA, you know, they call it peer review. or the PCAOB in examination. And these are overall controls over to see if the, the quality is there. So the AICPA has a peer review program. I don't know if we talked about this or not. Uh, the AICPA peer review program is every three years, another audit firm will come in and see if you're doing audits that are up to snuff. The idea becoming, uh, being that, you know, say, okay, the auditors are checking on other people, who's checking on the auditors? So that's what these 
kind of review the working papers, uh, you'll have other people from the outside come in, members of the AICPA, other members of the AICPA will come and do an audit, or the PCAOB will have an examination of, they'll come and say, okay, we wanna see how you're doing, are you doing these audits if they're a publicly traded company, or if they're, if they're publicly traded clients, and they'll say, you know, they'll have people come in. And it's uh, zero to 100, it's every three years. You guys don't remember this. Um, if they have over 100 clients, then it's every year. Permanent file are used every, I mean, we probably don't need to go too far into this. There are things that you keep every year. For instance, the organization chart. You know, you'll start out with a, you'll start out with an organization chart to know who to talk to. Okay, who's the controller? Who's the treasurer? Who's the whatever? You know, well, when you come in next year, you're going to have that same organization chart. Now you might update it, you know, in case somebody, oh, oh that, you know, that person's no longer the treasurer, that person's now the CFO or whatever, and this person's the treasurer. You know, so you might you update it, but a lot of things will be in a permanent file, those things that you will carry on from year to year. And so you, you can look through here, there's not too much. And there, but there are things that you probably wouldn't, um, you know, you wouldn't want to do every single year. Um, you probably just more like update these as you go along. And then there's the current file. This is the stuff that's only for this year. You know, this year's results basically are going to be in the current file. And so every year you'll have, you'll drag this uh, permanent file to the audit and kind of update it, you know, for whatever is important going from year to year. And this one is only for the current year stuff. Okay. I'm going to save that. Well, we're running a little late here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send out the um, multiple choice questions. I'll put up the poll and you guys can answer them. We'll go through them and put get the right answers down. And then we're, we're not going to do the, um, we won't do the uh, audit um, monetary unit sampling. So we'll just get that done. And then I'll, I'll send you guys out the test uh, tomorrow. So let me, give me a moment and I will send out the, um, actually it's in Blackboard. I think, I think that's a bit, let me check and see if they're available in Blackboard. But I'll, I'm also gonna send them out to you guys. Uh, chapter six, what's the choice review questions? Okay, they're in Blackboard, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and send them to. And I'll give you guys extra credit for it. Hopefully you guys got the poll up and hopefully the questions will be coming shortly here.
Okay. Uh, ooh, what am I doing here? Crazy stuff. <clears throat> well, let's see how you did. There's one. There's one out here that is um, is, is really hard. All right. This one is. Okay, number two, which statement is correct? Relate his uh, potential. Correct answer there is B. Successor order should get, obtain permission. You're required to contact the, um, the previous auditor before taking the client <clears throat> and uh, yeah and unless there's like some crazy circumstance like you know the, the previous auditor died or left the country or something like that they, if there's some something that makes it impossible but you should always be uh, attempts to make to contact the um, successor auditor or the predecessor auditor okay This. Okay, now this one's a little bit tricky. Now notice, here's the key word in this one. Uh, identified. Now it would have been tested through testing the transactions and that sort of thing, but it would have been identified probably by analytical procedures. You know, the addition, the uh, abnormal fluctuations that would kind of identify it, point you in the right direction. Now you would test the transactions. You know, this is true as, as far as whether you would see if, um, to see if, if, they, if they are misstated, materially misstated. Uh, unsupported entries in the ledger from uh, the ledger. So you go from the ledger. So, if, for instance, if they say they have assets on the books and you want to see if they're not supported, you say, okay, we're going to take these ledger entries for equipment and go find that piece of equipment or the documents that you know, they bought it. <clears throat> okay. So they're going to determine whether, whether invoices were prepared. So this would be completeness. Do they have all the, are, are all the invoices billed out to clients? And you might say that might be kind of strange, but if they're trying to reduce their taxes, they may want to not want to count that as revenue. So you get these shipping documents, but they ship the stuff out, but they didn't make the invoices. They didn't bill, you know, their customers. Tracing from source documents to the ledger. Completeness again. <clears throat> I should probably tell you that uh, a good chunk of auditing, a big, big chunk of it is completeness and existence. You know, the, um, uh, no. so existence and completeness, book to floor, floor to book, that's a really big part of auditing. So, in, in, you know, say it is, no, not that. You know, when you look at these assertions, You look at these assertions and they all look like they're, you know, kind of a mush, like they're all, um, you know, the same value and whatever. None of them are particularly interesting. Uh, these two kind of reign supreme when it comes to looking for things that are materially misstated. 
does it does it exist? You know, the, the sales exist. You know, uh, occurrence also existence and occurrence usually go together. Maybe down here would be a better. This would probably be a better one to highlight. So existence or occurrence, did the sales happen? Does the piece of equipment exist? That sort of thing. And then completeness, is everything in there? Those two are the most important. Uh, or, or they generally take up a, the biggest chunk of the audit. Okay. Eight. <clears throat> D is not a bad answer. B is the best answer. And that is, if you can't complete the audit, you shouldn't take it. If I can highlight it. Uh, this one's not a bad one in that it might be shopping for um, accounting principles. You know, they might be looking around for some, you know, to see if another firm will agree to their way of doing something. Uh, it could also, the way it's written here, though, it could also just be that they're <laughs> they're very nervous. They're very by the book, and so they consult with a, a number of people to see if they're doing it right. Um, but if you can't, if you don't think you can, can uh, complete the audit, you shouldn't take it, whatever the reason be. Yep. And again, this is existence. This is. Um, Ten is the trickiest one. Oh, oh, I don't know who got it, but one of you did. The predecessor auditor is no obligation to contact the successor. The successor auditor does. The predecessor has no um, no obligation to contact the successor. Very good, all right. Well, let me save this, stop sharing. Okay, very good. Look at my screen here. Okay, um, so I'll be sending out the test. Let me stop sharing here. So I'll, I'll send out the test, the chapter six test by tomorrow. Uh, I'll, I'll, I might get it out tonight. I'll, I'll try to get it out tonight. But uh, if I don't, and it, We'll see, <laughs> um, but I'll get it out and uh, I'll add five onto your, your two scores and it'll be due Friday the 25th, so uh, a week from this Friday. All right, uh, any questions? Nope, no. Okay. All right, well, I will uh talk to you guys in a week's time and i'll send out the test uh assuming by tomorrow thank you good night good night